When I was five, my father brought me my first car magazine. It was a 1986 issue of Car and Driver. And in it was a DeLorean with the doors up and, and all that. Pretty much just like you see that one. And, uh, and, and that was it for me. When I saw that with the stainless steel, with the doors, with the Italian styling, that was pretty much it. It's a, it's a, it's a completely emotional thing. We have had people that have come in here that have been kids that have come in in between their dad's legs saying, I want a DeLorean, and they've grown up and come and bought one. We've seen it happen so many times. When I was a teenager, when the car first came out in 1981, and it was just completely different from anything else on the roads here in America, it just caught my attention, and I stuck with it ever since. Everywhere you went, people are looking at it, pointing at it. When you open the doors, it's like a magnet. Uh, astonishing, it really is astonishing. Yeah. And everybody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to touch painted cars. Everybody wants to touch a stainless steel car. Don't know why. You don't go to a kitchen sink and do this, do you? <laughs> it's all that kind of attention that you get with an exotic car, but with none of the pretentiousness. The stainless steel, because it's, it's so unique, the gold wing doors, no, you know, it's the only car out there. Even you know the the rear engine layout. It's a true grand touring sports car. This is the job that I wanted when I was 16 years old. You know, had the original company carried on, I'd probably be sweeping floors in a factory someplace. But just by happy accident, I happened to be here. The history of the original DeLorean Motor Company is uh, is. It, it, it's had more history as a company out of business than it's had, had as a company I was actually operating. It's fun to be involved so intimately supporting the legacy that is John DeLorean, uh, the car that bears his name. Here was a guy who uh, grew up in a really bad part of Detroit uh, in, in the 1920s, 1930s, from a broken home, managed to get himself into college on a scholarship, served in the Army, supported his family, his mom and his brothers, uh, got a job at uh, Packard. Packard at the time was on the downhill slide and uh, we're in financial trouble. And it worked to John's advantage incredibly, was that he was able to move up the ladder quite dramatically uh, so that when he left Packard after five or six years, he was head of research and development and he was still, you know, still in his 30s. I mean, he went to Pontiac. John was there during the days of the Pontiac GTO, widely regarded as probably the most commercially successful of the muscle cars of that 60s era. And then from there went to Chevrolet and then into General Motors Corporate, uh, where he rose to the rank of uh, one of the vice presidents of all of North America, and rose to you know one step away from the presidency and decided, no, this ain't my thing. I want to do my own car. Married a supermodel uh, and then lost it all. The people that were around when the cars came out love it um, for the same reason like car nerds love Tucker. He just, he shot so high. John Delore, he really went for it, you know, and when reality came crashing down, it came crashing down hard. And I think this car reflects that. I mean, you look at this car today and you go, that car is 30 years old, that design? They sold that 30 years ago? You're like, what? Come on. And, and it must have been like a spaceship. I was privileged to be a General Motors Institute in the early 60s. And John was a hero amongst the student group. You know, he was the guy with the white lapels and the pink suits and the long hair in this fuddy-duddy General Motors organization. He was at the forefront of what we were looking to try and do with the company. Um, and he left and wrote his book on a clear day, you can see General Motors. And that book is, is what we came to do, is to build that dream, which was about how you did things differently in the car industry, how you didn't build for obsolescence, that you built a product that was gonna be there for for, this, for the life of the, of the people, not just the life of the car. The dream was to do what he wanted to do in the right way. He ba almost invented the muscle car. Chrysler really came up with the muscle car with their 300 series in the 50s, but the idea of the muscle car was really, you know, DeLorean with the Pontiac GTO in the 60s. One of the things that John always said is that when you're an engineer, you're like the quarterback, and then when you get promoted into management, you're like the guy that owns the team. You're not even a coach. You're the guy that owns the team. You don't have a lot of control over the nuts and bolts. And I think that's what he missed. And that's kind of what I think he hoped to get back into 
when he started his own company. And of course, I guess it never seems to work out that way because you, uh, he spent so much of his time getting the company off the ground, chasing money. Uh, he was forced to delegate. For when I first saw him, I thought, my God, uh, Hollywood has come to the West Belfast. <laughs> and his manner, he was, and he never forgot a name. He, he did take an interest in people and they would have worked their socks off for him. He'd go around the factory about every three or four months. He'd meet a guy and the next time he'd find out that that guy's wife was pregnant. Then he'd find out the next time he'd say, how's the, how's the baby coming along? And he, and he remembered the people. So he got their support from top management right down to guys on the shop floor who rarely saw the managing director in a normal car factory. The most amazing man I've ever met in my life. Charm uh, oozing out of him, highly intelligent. John was polished, urbane, smooth, and so in some ways very down to earth. In other ways, off in the clouds, but in actual fact, you know, his vision of what he wanted, he was very firm on. There's a presence about the guy. When he went to the motor show, it was like Lady Di and Prince Charles arriving. It was that kind of a guy. He just created those kinds of impressions and things around him. Look, he had, his, he had his downsides. He was, like all charismatic people, he had his, his things he focused on. Like, for example, the, um, the steering might not be working, but if the grain finish on the leather was not right, then it would be the grain finish on the leather we focused on. I've worked for Nutters all my life, and he was, he comes along in the same charismatic way. He's an equal nutter, but they're, they're successful people. They're different. They're, that's why they're successful. The people that worked at DeLorean, all of the engineers and the people that were in management were the best of the best. As DeLorean was putting the factory together, it was the most exciting thing automotive-wise that was going on globally. So he had the pick of who he wanted. He was the Tesla of the day. He, you know, everybody wanted to be part of, this was something different, this was new. And he had the best of the best. The best of the best took their protégés with them. And they, all those proteges now, are what's running the global automotive industry. When he announced he'd got this dream car he was going to build that was ecologically sustainable and the car of the future, wouldn't rot and would last forever, we thought, wow, what a great idea. Something we'd always thought we'd like to do, but we were stuck in a rut of tradition and the same way of making things. This was a chance to break the mold and do something really, really impressive. He had a consulting arrangement with Allstate, which was an insurance company here in the States, to create a safety vehicle, something that would be attractive, would be good in an accident, would not have a lot of repair expenses and things like that, and that morphed into the DeLorean safety vehicle, which became the DMC-12, which was supposed to be an ethical sports car, a car that uh, would be good on gas, would have good performance, would last a long time, uh, would be stylish, would be comfortable for people of all sizes to drive. John being 6'4", wanted a sports car he could fit into. The first step John made uh, was to locate a designer, someone to pin the exterior shape of the car. Giugiaro, at, at the time, he was popular very much in that mid-70s time frame. So they spoke to him and they decided, okay, he's our guy. They gave him a set of parameters as far as height of the car, how much legroom, how much headroom, and then he went from there and pinned this shape that's actually very close to what went into production. John had originally planned on doing all the engineering here in the United States because he figured the car would be built here in the States. He very, he very quickly figured out though that when he talked about employing 2,500 or so people, he got a lot of calls from all over the all over the world saying, we'll give you this if you build Deer Factory here because everybody wanted the jobs in their market. That led to the decision to build the car outside Belfast, Northern Ireland. The reason I joined the company, I said, you've got to experience working with a man who in 45 days can persuade somebody to give him 45 million pounds, which is <laughs> what he did with the, the UK government. It made sense then to have the car engineered close to where it was going to be built. So John made an arrangement with Colin Chapman at Lotus and arranged to have them do all the engineering on the car. I think it was muted at the board meeting that there was a possibility of carrying out a, an engineering project for a whole car, uh, which could, could be the DeLorean. There was quite a, a current of opinion that said, no, we don't want to do this project because it might compete with our Esprit. 
you know, when he and Colin were sort of circling each other, you know, they were both uh, similar characters in one way. They both exuded a confidence and charisma. He insisted that Colin Chapman was involved in the project. That was one of his fundamental requirements. They had promised the British government that they would have a car in production in a very tight time frame, about 18, 24 months, and uh, everybody knew that that was, you know, that was an incredibly optimistic number. And uh, they had believed that the prototype was just needing the last little bit of engineering and sourcing to be done, and really that wasn't the case. I was contacted by Colin who said, we're going to fly to Phoenix next week and we're going to test the DeLorean prototype. We met. Uh, Bill Collins. When we were talking to him, you know, we, we said, "Well, we've come, we've come to test the, the prototype." And, and Bill, sort of taken aback, we said, "Well, it's not actually a prototype. If you like, it's a, a mock-up or a mule that sort of gives you the visual impact externally and internally. You know, the steering wheel's in the right place, the instrument package, and the seats." We persevered. We, we had to sort of reverse and get out of the sand a number of times. There were tumbleweed blowing about. We took the car on the freeway. It just died on us. A police cruiser came along, fortunately, and shouted at us through a bullhorn and came up and shunted us off onto the, onto the side, uh, which was a rather ignominious end to our test and evaluation. And on the way back, I wrote a document, what was later called, Barry Wills told me, called War and Peace which actually was just, a, was just a purely objective report on what we considered to be the major areas that would need redesigning, re-engineering. And also, we did propose fairly major uh, changes. There was a famous meeting at Ketteringham Hall. The whole meeting consisted of Mike Kimberley reading his report. Bill had told Mike at the tests in Phoenix, Arizona, that the last thing he wanted really was for this car to be assessed because it's a car that had been built to raise money. It was not a representative prototype of a production car. I don't think Bill was very happy. I had to go through these various issues, which is totally understandable. I wouldn't have been happy in his position. That's basically what Lotus got was a concept that had been constructed to raise money. Looked great. Uh, Gijara's work was phenomenal. Little else, I don't think there were any engineering drawings. In fact, I'm sure there weren't. I know there wasn't. So it, it was really a blank sheet of paper. And that's why it was only a company with Lotus's maverick capabilities uh, that could have done the job in anything like the time. The 18 months was totally unrealistic, but you know, we, we went along with it and for uh, quite a period of time there were in fact two timing programs. There was the official timing program that related to 18 months. There was the realistic timing program which was more like 24 months. Starting from really a, a, new, a new start uh, in Northern Ireland uh, to the point where the car was certified was 28 months, a record, a world record one that still stands and I suspect will never be broken because nobody's quite as mad as we were in those days. 375 guys at the peak of the project, all working 724, literally, round the clock for two, uh, over two years. And the DeLorean guys over in Belfast and Barry Wills' team in Coventry, everybody just put everything into that project and they made it happen. The starting point was n nowhere near w w what we'd been promised. The good fortune was that a number of qualified people came to, very experienced, very talented people came together, all with egos, typically. But they just, everybody just, just clicked. Yeah, I mean, there were people outside of the, uh, outside of the project who were, everybody was skeptical. But those that were involved were just, just absolutely dedicated to getting this thing done. It was rags to riches. We turned a sow's ear into a silk purse. We started afresh with the new car with very difficult specification, rear engine, going door, stainless steel body on top of another body, and then achieved what was quite frankly a remarkable, very remarkable miracle in terms of automotive engineering 
and design. It really was, I believe. You know, that's a story that's worth telling. Anybody that was as close to what reality was with DeLorean, we'd all admit that doing what we did was crazy. Um, we did it despite that. We would have all liked more time and it would have been a better car had we had more time. But I think we all take pleasure and pride in the fact that it isn't a bad car, despite what lots of people say. It's not a bad car. It's not the car it might have been had we had the time and the money to do the job in the way that a mature vehicle manufacturer of that time would have done it. We were a mixture of crazies. We were a mixture of guys like uh, dear George, George Broomfield, who was at the end of his career, who wanted to go out on a last hurrah, uh, and young guys, you know, I was still in my 30s, young guys like me and others that were excited by the whole prospect and wanted to show the world what could be done. If you went to a company today and asked them to design, engineer, build, and prove a new car for the USA market in 28 months, they just laugh at you. Even with today's computers and technologies, they just, they'd laugh at you. I worked at Ford Motor Company. It took us five years from scratch to develop a brand new car. That was with all the engineers in place, all the factories in place, all the tools and mouldings and things in place. So designing a plant around something you didn't know what was going to go into it was even more complex. As the product became more and more mature, we knew what was to go into the factory. and We built the factory um, as we were developing the car. We were selecting suppliers way before many of the components were fully engineered. We effectively invented, without realising it, what the industry very soon afterwards called simultaneous engineering, which is where the two departments work closely. It's where the purchasing department identifies the supplier very early on and the supplier gets involved in the development of the part. It's now called simultaneous engineering. And that's how cars get done much more quickly than they were in the pre mid-80s period that we were operating it because it was the only way it could be done. The Japanese invented simultaneous engineering but they did it properly <laughs> and professionally. We did it of necessity. Building a factory from a greenfield site where there were two streams running across the land. It was a swamp. swamp. We took three metres of mud out of that place and lowered the mountain in Belfast to put rock in it so we could build a factory on it. We didn't start from the ground up, we were started from below ground up. Clearly we had great people that came in from the States. You know, if you want to build a factory, bring a Texan in. And we had a Texan that roamed around with a cup of coffee on all day long. The Japanese invented all the stuff that we were doing at that time later. You know, the factory was clean, it was grey everywhere. We had fights with fork truck companies because they wouldn't want their fork trucks painted grey. Our fork trucks were grey. The whole place was was immaculate. And you read about 5S's and black belts and all that stuff. We were doing that then, back in the 80s. So it was before its time in many, many areas. In reality, we built an organisation as well, which was also from scratch, basically interviewing every employee, writing the procedures, the disciplines, the controls, the processes. It was all new and it was all exciting at that time. Barry talks about simultaneous engineering. It was simultaneous everything. I looked after the the building of the body shop, which was the fastest built building in Northern Ireland at that time. In 13 months it was built and equipped. For the first time ever in Northern Ireland, for many, 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 many years of troubles over there, there was no sectarian divide at DeLorean. Everybody worked together, totally committed for the company. All religions and nobody, and I heard the myth about the Protestants had to come in at one end and the Catholic came in. What a load of nonsense. This was a Catholic Protestant factory working in harmony, side by side, through all of the worst times in Northern Ireland. Hunger strikes, you know, Bobby Sands' death. Bobby Sands, of course, was the leader of the hunger strikers. He had stood for Parliament whilst in the maze and been elected a member of Parliament. He was obviously very high profile. He was the first of the hunger strikers to die. They weren't allowed to wear their own clothing in prison. And they considered, of course, that they were political prisoners rather than criminals. And 
uh, adopted a routine of wearing blankets instead as a protest. I think it was about eight that uh, went on hunger strike. San's family, his mother, lived on the Twinbrook estate, which was uh, on the north side of the plant. The Seymour Hills um, estate, which was largely Protestant, loyalist, was to the south. San's body was taken back to the family home in the early hours of the morning. A protest started on Twinbrook. Rioting commenced, the army moved on to the estate. Uh, they drove, uh, purely by accident, I think, the rioters towards the fence of the site, the DeLorean Dunmurray site. Several departments' records were lost that night when they were the buildings were firebombed. They were completely and utterly destroyed. I can remember guys in tears um, going through trying to find cabinets, uh, filing cabinets that were still intact, that um, you know they could get to their records. These guys had spent you know anything up to two years building up records. When the terrapin burnt down, all the engineering drawings went. You know, other companies would have folded up shop and walked out. But everyone goes, what ex next? This, what else do you want to do to us? You know. It was the start of what became a number of chaotic days. Uh, the army moved onto the site. My office uh, window faced the side of Twinbrook and we had a member of the Welsh Fusiliers kneeling with a gun poking out of the window, um, effectively guarding us whilst we were working for that day. It was an extraordinary day. The army effectively turned the training building into a barracks. The army slept there. Armoured vehicles were in the plant. Armoured vehicles were in the training building. It was like a movie. I was in my office quite late. My then wife was back in the West Midlands uh, with my two daughters and uh, she had a habit of ringing me uh, when she was having difficulty with their maths homework. I was standing looking out of the window for inspiration while I was doing it and I was suddenly aware of a Molotov cocktail crashing about two feet away from my car uh, below me. Um, so I, I, I didn't sort of, I just said, Sorry, darling, but I think I'm going to have to cut the call close. There's something I need to be attending to and put the phone there. That was a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> Myron Stilinidis, uh, he was our personnel chief, was actually given um, a schedule by the uh, Northern Ireland office, which I guess came from the security forces, of the likely death days of the hunger strikers so that we could prepare ourselves for each passing as it came. Uh, pretty, you know, sad thing to have to report on, but that's the way in which we were having to monitor things because that predicted when we were likely to have more problems from outside. It at least enabled us to, to do a little bit of planning. We used to plan the body build because we knew that the one faction of the factory would be missing on certain days. So we'd work around. It wasn't a big issue. We just got on with it. All of that stuff going on inside the factory, you didn't have a whisper. None of that stuff went on inside the factory. We drove through roadblocks every, every single day. We, were, we, we, we never knew which way we were going home. You, you know, you'd find roads you'd never seen in your life before, driving between the factory and Bangor. Guns all around you. It was something like a wartime spirit. There were so many forces against this thing um, that the people then that naturally came together to repel what was the common enemy. <laughs> which is every, every doomsayer, every newspaper article, spirit put the spirit back in. The first thing that hit me when I walked in the door was the buzz. The telephone was ringing. Everybody seemed to be wanting to you know, get on with it. I said, this is not too bad. And that was an experience never to be forgotten because they were the greatest bunch of guys you could ever meet. You know, you hear a lot of things about West Belfast, but I was really th thrilled that the the, the work ethic and, and people who had never had a job before, perhaps they felt that they, they wanted to have a job, but they really worked well and I have never had a complaint about it. Everybody was pulling in the same direction. Everybody wanted it to succeed. And that's why the impossible was achieved. It had to be sustainable. It, 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 it was this, this perfect last forever, stainless steel and composite and Nothing on it that would ever deteriorate or ever ever change. You know, things wear out, but basically the basic structure had got to carry on forever. The must-haves were quite simple. There were three. Firstly, stainless steel as an exterior body. 
material. The second were gullwing doors and the third was a rear mounted engine. And a rear mounted engine in John's mind had to be the PRV engine. Colin and I, we tried very, very hard to persuade John DeLorean not to have a rear engine and not to have a Duvron engine. We wanted a more high revving, higher performance engine with more torque as well as power. But John DeLorean, as it turned out, apparently already signed a deal for the Duvron engine. Those are the only three things that were sacrosanct. And in fact, I remember talking to John about, you know, why stainless steel, why gullwing doors? And his answer was quite simple. When you're a brand new car manufacturer and you've got a car to present to the public, it's got to have things that are totally and utterly special. I can always remember the, there was a big problem in how you could hold the gullwing doors up. And you couldn't find any way of actually powering that door up so that it was easy. You know, you could sit there and just push it up. And the only way we did it in the end, we finished up working, I think it was Grumman Aerospace, and they're sorogenically uh, treated torsion bars in the roof, which, which actually provide the torque for that door to be able to you know, be easy to open and then to hold up. And that, you know, things like that were just, was unthought of when we started the project. And they were some of the concerns we had, but nevertheless they were achieved by the teams. Uh, another one was the engine. It wouldn't meet the CARB, California Air Resources Board, new upcoming standards. They weren't selling that engine over there. Tony Rudd and his guys had to work flat out on that engine. They even in invented at that stage airstream injection. It was the only way we could meet the emission test. But a lot of things like that happened because you were pushing the envelope, pushing it all the while. And we enjoyed that, I've got to be honest. You know, that's the sort of thing that Lotus was there for. What was the industry calls job one car, the first saleable production car, uh, was taken off the line in February of 1981. There's a whole series of photographs that exist of the so-called first car coming off the line, which John um, inspected. The first actual car off the production line was driven off the line by one of the Lotus chassis engineers, a guy called Michael Foxen. Mike drove the car off the line, drove out of the doors and promptly collided with a stillage. John never knew. I don't know, I think John probably went to his grave without knowing. The first time the car was shown publicly in the UK was at the Belfast Motor Show. It was absolutely unbelievable. Every cameraman, any, every cinematographer, every press man in the hall surrounded the car. And that's the impact it had uh, throughout 81. First shipment of cars left in Northern Ireland, Easter Sunday, 1981. When the cars arrived to the States, they quickly realized, okay, we've got a problem here. Uh, the people at the factory had no automotive manufacturing experience, no automobile assembly experience, uh, at, at least the line people. They had brought in foremen and executives and managers. Still had the people turning the wrenches who really, you know, in many cases, they had not had a job their entire life. Their fathers had not had a job their whole lives. So it was really a new experience. They set up the quality assurance centers in the States and, you know, they were spending initially an exorbitant amount of man hours per car virtually rebuilding them. Such were cash flow pressures on us in the run up to April. The first cars that were shipped were not uh, the best cars that could have been produced. People even in mass production lines, even the biggest companies in the world run pilot lines for months and months before the car starts to roll down production and because, because of the timing we, we didn't have that privilege. Later on in production after they'd built a couple thousand cars things got much much better. Bit by bit they were communicating with the factory and they were getting it better and better. During the course of the, the time that they were producing the cars there were some 3,000 plus production changes that were implemented basically to improve the quality of the car. Once the car got 
into the hands of dealers. I mean, people had been waiting for the car for three, four, five years. Uh, it was not unusual to see this $25,000 car back in 1981 selling for 35000 40000 because everybody wanted to be the first one to have one. Through the first uh, six months of, until the winter of 1981, uh, they actually outsold Porsche and Mercedes here in the States. The demand for the cars was utterly phenomenal. The dealers couldn't get enough, screaming for more cars than we could produce. I had become disenchanted with things. I, that started in the middle of 1981, when John forced the increase in production from 50 a day to 80 a day that necessitated us bringing in an additional shift. That, in my view, was almost suicide. There's no way we were ever going to train the people quickly enough there was no way we were ever going to build quality cars that way. It was the beginning of the end, put it simply. John was preparing a stock offering for the New York Stock Exchange. In fairness to him, it was what government wanted. Government wanted out, and the way out was for John to effectively privatise the company. Lifting cars from 50 to 80 a day and projecting that forward into 82, 83, developed a business plan that was phenomenally successful and highly profitable. Just the sort of plan that would go down well on the New York Stock Exchange and could attract investors and make John a very rich man. Because John effectively was selling out his stake in DeLorean Motor Company. He would have become a multi, multi-millionaire. That was obviously of great attraction. I mean, John was attracted to money in a, in a big, big way, there's no doubt about that. They added a second shift on the assembly line, they added a third shift in the body press plant where they made the fiberglass underbodies, and they bought the raw materials, the inventory, uh, when they were planning to build as, as many as 400 cars a week. Double shifting was a disaster. Like, I can remember standing with George Broomfield and this horde of people arrived for to go on the new shift, and uh, this guy came over to us and he says, uh, Where's the trim line? And George says, uh, better see the supervisor. And he says, I am the supervisor. And I felt that if the Florian had have kept the plant the size it was originally, I think he could have made a success of it because the car was getting better and better and better. That very quickly ate up all the working capital they had going into late 1981, which coincidentally happened to be about the time the economy started to go into a bit of a recession. We had enough money to build the factory, we had enough money to build the car, we even had enough money to cope with the 18 to 20 percent inflation that was going on at that time. But the minute the first car was built, we effectively ran out of money. So all that time we were pumping money into boatloads of cars and trainer loads of cars with no financing for it. There were several things happened, you see, that, that resulted in money becoming tight. One was that Inflation was raging at that time. The second thing was that the relationship with the pound and the dollar was going completely haywire too. That was all impacting upon our costs. It was an extremely bad winter. 1981, uh, some say it was the worst in 30 or 40 years. And when interest rates are 16, 17 percent on car notes and it's a bad winter, it's a bad time to be selling $25,000 sports cars. That come in one color. The country stopped buying anything. Car companies stopped selling cars, dealers stopped selling cars. Volkswagen were building the Rabbit in America in those days, the original Golf. They closed their American plant for it never to open again. It never reopened. VW could afford to do things like that. We couldn't. So the line of credit filled. Bank of America said no more, no more, no more, no more money. John was unable to come up with any more money, was unable to get any more money from the British government. So they laid off all except a literally skeleton crew of perhaps 20 or 30 people just to keep things from going to seed. But of course, in October 82, uh, John DeLorean, uh, unbeknownst to anybody except himself and the federal government here in the States, uh, was slowly getting ensnared into the sting operation uh, where he was being uh, promised an extreme financial windfall that he could put into the company. All he needed to do was invest some money in this, uh, what turned out to be a uh, cocaine trafficking deal. Once John figured out what it was in his book, he says uh, he tried to back out. 
they threatened the life of his daughter, who was three, four years old at the time, said they'd send her, that they would send her head home in a shopping bag. And so John didn't feel like he had any option, other option but to c continue to cooperate. And then, of course, we all have seen the video uh, of John sitting in the hotel room with uh, ha having been shown the suitcase of cocaine and, and, and then getting arrested. Of course, when you're arrested, it's on page one of the paper. Literally, just almost two years later, when you're found not guilty uh, by a jury, it's, you know, it's page three of the life section. Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, I remember him. Uh, and it just really shattered his career as an industrialist. He was really never able to recover from that. I feel, yes, it was the Labour government gave the money. But the next government come in, the lady wasn't really interested. And quite honestly, had he been given that money at the time, John DeLorean wouldn't have been caught up in the drug scene or anything else. The man was desperate. And he had a plant going and over 2,000 odd people, you know, it was the best thing ever happened in Northern Ireland. The political establishment wanted to make a point about the previous government. You now it had gone from socialist to conservative. I have to say so, if, if John DeLorean had put his hand in his pocket, or and the British government together had put in a very small amount. It was a tiny amount, retrospectively, if you look at it now, it was a tiny amount. That company would still be going today and employ thousands of people. So DeLorean himself was, a, pardon me saying so, an idiot to do what he did. It was definitely a Labour government product, um, which was not not required to be successful from a Conservative government point of view. We were a lean, mean machine making lovely cars that people really wanted but we didn't have the cash flow to keep going forward and John in his desperation to solve that problem got involved in some stupid things and everybody had to close the door at that point. So everything was there for success it really what stood in the way of it was political gerrymongering from our friend Maggie. Ronald Reagan had just come into office here in the States and uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were real tight. They were very good friends. Ronald Reagan's wife, the First Lady Nancy Reagan, had started this war on drugs. And I don't, I don't doubt that someone in the DEA or the FBI came up and said, you know, we need a big name. We need to really nab somebody. And, uh, you know, maybe the whole DeLorean thing was becoming too much of a thorn in the British government side. You know, Margaret Thatcher talked to Ronald Reagan and they said, well, you know, you know this guy John DeLorean, Somebody had the idea, you know, John DeLorean's in trouble, he'd probably do anything for money. Let's find out. My theory is this, that um, during the FBI sting operation, when they had identified a high-profile individual that met their need of being linked with James Hoffman to get into the origins of the Colombian drug chain, John became the perfect example, perfect candidate. Having kept my diaries from that time, I can track uh, my diaries that were recording times at which the receiver was going to close the company. When I compare my diaries with the Sunday Times book, the DeLorean tapes, you can track pretty well the time at which the British government became aware of what was going on. It's around the time that in one of the taped conversation, John makes a claim that he's close to the IRA. And that, I believe, is when uh, the whole sting operation was brought to the attention of the British government. From then on in, uh, I believe that the pacing of the closure of the company was delayed and delayed and delayed until the FBI had arrested John DeLorean. The company was not going to be closed ahead of that because had it been closed, had any of the previous deadlines been met, then the sting operation could not have been completed. It was a sad day when, when DeLorean closed. Very sad. And it was a sad day that, that that he himself unfortunately was so desperate to get the money to keep the place going and it wasn't forthcoming. I mean the workforce over in Dunmurray were just 
I mean, you, you, it made you want to cry when this thing looked as if it was going to, going to finish because they had just put their heart and soul into, into you, nothing was too much trouble. Uh, lots of people would tell you that he didn't give a stuff about the people in, in Belfast, didn't give a stuff about the war, workforce. He was only interested in his own, his own ambitions and, and being a superstar and all that. I don't believe that, frankly. I, I think there was good about the man and I think he did care about people. I think so. And I will continue to think so. When John DeLorean was acquitted on all the civil and criminal charges from all of the trials that he went through up through 1986 or so that were a result of the fall of the company. He always uh, was working on his next car project, but I always, I always think, you know, once you lose $200 million of other people's money, you're not likely to get any more. First time I met John at his home in 97, we sat out on the back porch at his house. One of the things he said that still sticks with me, you know, here 15, 17 years later is that I've got a lot of good ideas, but nobody will listen to me anymore. And that's, you know, that's, that's really painful, you know, when you've got a guy who's got such, a, uh, such an incredible intelligence. John DeLorean's legacy really exists in the 9,000 some cars that bear his name, uh, the hundreds of thousands of other cars, perhaps millions, that all have some feature that he invented or had a part in. Our primary business here in Texas is the sales, service, and restoration of DeLorean cars. Uh, at any given time, we've got between 35 and 45 cars here for service or restoration, literally from all over the world. When the factory closed, um, they were still left with about 17, 1800 unsold cars and a factory full, full of parts to build more. Fast forward to 1997, uh, Stephen was able to acquire all of that inventory of parts that remained, uh, which was still enough to fill this 40,000 square foot building here full of literally millions of brand new DeLorean parts from the factory. Uh, nuts, bolts, washers, glass, stainless wheels, seals, rubbers, lights, just about anything you can think of, all are still available. I had talked with John DeLorean on the telephone several times over the years. When we first opened up here, we had a grand opening, and, and at the time, John was in uh, poor health, so we, we, we'd invited him, but he was unable to attend. But there was lots of DeLorean enthusiasts here that, that took videos and pictures that, that he'd seen, at videos, pictures, and he'd seen the facility, and um, was, was very impressed with what we were doing. The 73% of the cars that were manufactured in Belfast are still running today, and that is a heck of a high percentage in, in, in the automotive world. The achievement, even after what happened at the end, was never recognised. Um, it was always, you know, the media were hot on the trail of, you know, what they considered to be a nasty story. We never got to tell the real story. We tried, but nobody wanted to listen. We outsold Jaguar the whole time we were selling against them. So there was a chance, and Jaggy was not high volume, but nor were we. So if, if, if some of those things that were against us <laughs> had not happened, then there's a chance we'd have come through that dip and the receiver would never have arrived and we could have turned this thing around and made it happen. So I don't think that, that the doom merchants that wanted this thing to fail right from the beginning were proved to be wrong. And if we had a little bit more time, we'd have proved them totally wrong. Well, I think with John's attitude and innovation, we'd be into electric cars, we'd be into cell cars, we'd be into you know, whatever was the latest technology, he would have driven the company there. You know, could you have financed it? Who knows? But at the end of the day, the one thing he was, and you look at the cars that he developed in the US, he was visionary. I mean, we had 80 million pounds overall. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's a flea bite in the motor industry. There wasn't enough money, but it wasn't wasted. There are 2,000 people still employed on the site at Dunmurray. They're making some of the most advanced motor components there in the buildings that we vacated. And you have to remember, we only sold the car in the United States. We'd got Japan, Germany, the Middle East, Australia, the rest of the world to go at. We hadn't even started when it finished. Just such a pity. We'd still be here now with an exciting product range selling it all over the world and very profitably. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Absolutely not. It was two or three years of 
absolutely intense, round the clock, hard work and, and pain and suffering and everything else. But I, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. It was just, it was, the, you know, kind of best time. It's, de it's a defining point in your career, I think. I worked later on with a lot of guys out at the Lorraine, and they all said the same. The happiest days of their life. It wasn't only his dream, it was our dream. And he had a dream, but every employee in that plant had a dream, and the dream was to have a job for life. And they would have done anything for that to happen. For me, particularly living in the US, the, the car became about the movie and it became about John and what happened at the end. And the reality of this, for people like us, we focus on what was done here. And it was done on a remarkable time scale. It was done with very talented, dedicated people. I think it's a little bit sad, to be honest, that a lot of it surrounds the, uh, the Back to the Future films. It's, it's kind of... You know, you feel a bit insulted that it's, it's developed all these bits of it. But on, on the other hand, it's kept it's kept it right at the forefront. And uh, yeah, and I, I guess it's become a cult largely because of that. It was flawed, not seriously flawed, but it was flawed in the sense that if you took a, a, a German viewpoint of you know precision and refinement and luxury and all that sort of stuff. I, I resent those things in those days. This is a very personal thing. I don't like German cars. I don't like Volkswagens and Audis and BMWs because they're just too good. They're so good, they're boring. I mean, you know what you're going to get. You sit in it and everything. And, and, and I feel that I need something which is a little bit flawed because it's got personality and soul and character. And the DMC-12 has got that in, in, in bundles. I mean, it just... It's full of it. It's lovely. And people love it. That's why they love it. That's why these people, you know, just have clubs and, and you know, there are owners' clubs all over the place. And, and people just love it because it, it, it has tremendous personality. Mm -hmm.